Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining here. Uh, nice of you guys to take the time on a Sunday. Uh, but here's a topic which is very, very uh, sort of dear to me because this changed the way how I practice dentistry. Uh, it made a massive difference if I felt, uh, let's say, my, my clinical skills, if they were at like 30% before I started using loops, they probably went to about 50% when I started using loops. And then after I got loops with a light, it went to about 80, 90%. So that's how, at least how I'm rating myself compared to my days when I didn't use loops. I was just 30%. So this is something which I want all of you to get into. There are a lot of people giving you bad advice about loops, uh, especially what to buy, or some of them even flat out saying, don't buy loops, your, your eyes will go bad and other such nonsense. So that is not something uh, which you should take seriously because the evidence supports the use of loops. So this is going to be a short webinar. It's not going to be super long. And we're going to talk about exactly how you select the loops. Um, and it's going to be very practical, right? So you, just the important points which you need to know is what we're going to talk about. So firstly, why loops? You might be looking with great suspicion as to should you really buy loops? What's in it for you? You've done dentistry just fine without loops. Everything is okay without loops. Why should you get into it? Or you're worried about the cost or you're worried about accommodating or, you know, whatever reasons you may have to not get into it. But basically, it gives you a lot more precision and accuracy. If you can't see it, you can't really say that you're being precise. And as you increase your magnification, you will see more and more clearly how, um, how much better your work could be. So better precision and accuracy, this is a huge thing, better ergonomics. This is something which, unfortunately, our dental schools don't teach us as what is good ergonomics, and that becomes a problem because what effectively happens is your career ends up getting cut short because you're maintaining terrible posture, trying to do good dentistry. You all come from a good place, you're trying to do good work, but because that posture, that position is so wrong, we are going to have an ergonomic problem. It helps in the earlier detection of issues, okay? So whatever, you know, there might be something enamel and your dentine and all of that is stuff which you need to see very closely. And sometimes without the loops, what are you trying to do? You're trying to look at a maxillary second molar and you're using the, the chair light and you're trying to reflect it off your mirror. You're doing all kinds of light physics just to try and see what can be easily seen if you had an LED light and a pair of loops. So you will, you will find problems before anyone else would typically find. And you can also educate the patient better. If you can find something faster and sooner, you can educate the patient better. You can practice preventive dentistry better, surgical, prosthetics, whatever it is, you can do all of that better. And very importantly, you can reduce your eye strain and fatigue. So main thing is carrier longevity. Okay, your career is going to be extended a lot if you use loops. And I give you real life examples uh, of two people. Both of them were in my practice. One was a more senior gentleman. He had to quit. He was around 58 or 59 when he retired because just backache, neck ache, shoulder ache from just a lifetime of doing dentistry without loops. Excellent dentist, but unfortunately had to quit my practice. He now just sits at home. He probably had a good 10, 15 years left of practice, but just unable to do so. That's example number one. Example number two is a much more uh, disappointing story because it was a 27 or 28 year old girl who was with my practice. And for her also, it was the same thing. Like she was having a very difficult time. Neck ache started and I advised her, you know, you have to get loops. And this is something which is the only way which is going to get things better for you. But she never took up that advice, unfortunately. And then she essentially stopped doing clinical dentistry, though she was very good at it. So again, we're we are losing people to the, to the nature of our profession, which is quite physically taxing. It's Even though you're sitting in one place, dentistry is very labor intensive. So there is evidence to support the fact that you have lesser musculoskeletal issues uh, when you're using loops. If you look at this picture, this is a very typical picture, even though it's a stock image. The dentist, the earnest dentist wants to do good work and comes therefore very, very close to the patient to try and see what they're doing, not realizing that it's putting an incredible stress. And that stress you may not feel right now, but over the years, you will end up feeling that kind of stress. So 
Loops are not new. The first operating microscope was in 1860, and the first loops in terms of dentistry would probably have been around 1978. So this is where we stand. We have now come a long way. The original loops were much bigger, much larger, much more cumbersome. Nowadays, they're much easier to work with. So why do we need loops? Basically, the human eye will deteriorate with age. As time goes on, the human eye is not going to function as it, as it was originally. And so we're going to have deterioration. You will have typically the age is around 40 where you start having issues with near reading, like reading. So that's exactly what dentistry is. So near distance acuity becomes a problem. And there's even presbyopia where the lens cannot accommodate properly and there's decreased sensitivity to contrast. So all of these reasons are why we need loops to sort of contract these issues which will happen. So at an earlier age, loops for musculoskeletal reasons and then at a later age, loops for your eyesight. So this is what we want to avoid, right? We want to avoid the picture on the left. And I'm sure a lot of you are doing this, a lot, a lot. I've seen so many young dentists practice, and I would say one out of 10 probably has the proper posture. Nine out of 10 are just breaking all the rules of ergonomics, especially simple things like keeping the patient's uh, level at your elbow level. Your patient's mouth should be at the elbow level for ease of working but sometimes they're working like this and that's going to be very, very bad on the system. But see, when you wear loops, you get into a generally more comfortable position. These are standard loops. These are not the ergonomic type of loops which have a bend, which I'm going to discuss. But basically, when you select loops, these are the things to worry about or think about. First, your magnification, of course. Then we're looking at the, let me see if I can get a mouse here. One second. Oh, never mind. So we're looking at the working distance. So that means from where you are sitting to where your patient's mouth is on the headrest in your typical angle of working, what is the distance from your eyes to the patient's mouth when they are in position? Don't try to figure it out with your thumb, right? You have to measure working distance in actual patient environment. The declination angle is where the loops exactly are. Are they tilted down this way? Are they all the way down? Do they, do they go straight and come down like this? And I'll show you some examples of that. Then the field of view and depth of field is something I'm gonna discuss in detail. So we'll get to that. Now you may look at this and call these loops. These really are not loops. These are just single lens and they give you these little attachments for different magnifications. You can get these very, very cheap. If you go on Amazon, you can get this for like about two or 3000 rupees. This is not worth the box it's sold in also. It's just not worth your time. Please don't invest in something like this. It's not an investment. This is just, this is, this is the mistake that people make, right? People buy something like this. They try it on for a week and they say, ah, loops don't work for me. This is just, it's, it's unacceptable. You know, this is like trying to run a marathon with, with uh, sand loops. It's just not going to happen. You cannot do it. So these kind of loops are, or these kind of magnifications are out. They may come with attractive features like a light. And I'll tell you that light is equally useless. And typically, let me see here. Here's a pair, old pair, which we have over here. Here, the light also just at some point gets damaged and that's the end of the light. If it works even for a month, congratulations. That's probably the world record for these kinds of loops. Okay. How do you know that these loops are not great? Because when you look at the resolution of those loops, the ones which I showed you, that's these guys, right? The resolution is very poor and you have something called spherical aberration where things are getting curved towards the side and that's especially bad for us as dentists because we want to see things as accurately as possible. So these are not good magnification to get. So now looking at what's a good magnification to get, you will typically be faced with choosing if you're looking at through the lens type of loops. And these are called through the lens because you can see that the magnification is mounted on the lens of the glass of the loops. You will typically be choosing something between Galilean or prismatic, okay? And what is really the difference? Galilean has two lenses typically, and you will be able to look through and it's lightweight and it has a limitation of being only up to three and a half X. If you're looking for higher magnifications, then you need to look at prismatic or Keplerian optics where they have a prism to extend the light 
beam or the range and this becomes three and a half to four and a half to even 10x you can even get loops at 10x so this is the a selection which is going to be very important for you it's going to come up when you're buying loops because your vendor is going to ask you are you looking at galilean or prismatic and you need to know what that is they each have their own advantages and disadvantages for example the galileans are typically lighter the prismatics are heavier but the prismatics allow you to go to higher magnifications and then the other question which i always get is the through the lens style which you just saw or should you do a flip up style i know uh, certain practitioners like the flip up style it doesn't necessarily have to be mounted on their on their spectacles or their goggles it could even be like a headband style so that there's no treasure on the bridge of the nose my problem or my preference is for ttl because ttl is lighter I don't have a problem with something sitting on the bridge of my nose. Some people do, and that's why they go for the flip up. But one thing about the flip up is it tends to be heavier because you have the hinge mechanism. This thing has to go up and down. So it tends to be heavier. And that's something which a lot of people will find uncomfortable. The other thing about the flip up, let's move on. The other thing about the flip up is you can actually change. Let me, I have a flip up over here. So this is a typical flip up. You can change the distance or the interpupillary distance. You see, you can move this back and forth. You can do that. You can change the angle depending on which direction your eye is, is your uh, eye is pointing to. You can adjust it on your face. And you may think that this is all very nice, but people who have used these loops, at least a good number of them tell me that they don't find this kind also convenient. One, they don't like the weight and two, all those little adjustments tend to keep moving around a little bit as the headband moves. So it gets a little frustrating to, to keep adjusting this. It's, it's one more thing you need to worry about when you're doing your clinical dentistry. So the, the flip up loops are less expensive. So that's an advantage. They're less expensive. Uh, you can make on the fly adjustments uh, in that way. It's better, but my recommendation is always to go for TTL loops because they're lighter. They are more expensive, but it's a much more premium product than your TTL. So the price differences also become very evident because you could get flip up loops at around 30,000 or so. And then you would have to look at something even beyond uh, 70, 80,000 or more if you're looking at a TTL type of uh, lens. But the difference is worth it, believe me. So what magnification should I choose? You should not really be choosing Galilean or Prismatic. That's not your worry. That's the vendor's worry. They need to tell you whether you choose Galilean or Prismatic. You need to first choose your magnification. You need to decide how much is right for you. And if you're going less than three and a half X, the Galileans are fine. Don't be uh, sort of pressured into buying buying the prismatic because it's not going to give you any major advantage. The vendor may tell you that the prismatic is more clear, there's more clarity, there's more resolution, but anything less than three and a half X or even three and a half X to begin with doesn't really have a major difference between the two. So I would say if you're choosing three and a half X or below, stick to Galilean. If you're going above that, you have no choice. You have to choose prismatic because Galilean lenses cannot give you those very high magnifications. So now we spoke about a topic earlier, which I need to come back to, which is field of view. Okay, so field of view is when you're using a pair of loops, how much can you really see through the loops? Because you're going to be limited by the boundary of the field of view of that particular pair of loops. So now if you have, I'm sorry, one second. There we go, do you see it again? Yes, sir. Yeah, so if you have low magnification, you're typically going to be seeing much more. As you go more and more magnified, you're going to be seeing less of a field of view. So let's say this was your surgical field where my hands are. You would see all of this with a 2.5x. Then when you go 3x, you're probably going to see this much. You're going to see it in more detail because you have more magnification, but you're going to see less at 3.5. And at 4x, you're going to see this. So field of view refers to, let's say, the horizontal or the, or the left to right or the mesial to distal, whatever you want to call it. But in this plane is what field of view is. As you go more magnification, you're going to see less field of view. So you need to be prepared for that. Because if you're doing extensive surgeries, let's say, across the arch, 
having very high magnification is going to limit your field of view. That's going to be a problem. But let's say you're doing endo and it's on a single tooth. Having a high magnification is perfect because you're focused only on that one tooth. You don't really care about what's happening around. You just want that one tooth in high magnification. And then there's another concept called depth of field. Depth of field also depends on the loops, the manufacturer, the magnification. But basically, if you, it's if this uh, Finding Nemo picture here illustrates it perfectly. But if you have good depth of field, you can see your object which you're focusing on. So it's this distance. It's from here to here, where field of view was this distance, depth of field is this distance. So if your object was, let's say, this glass of water, which is around here, can you see things beyond that glass of water in focus? So that is called your depth of field. So again, when you go from 2.5 to 4.5, the type of lens changes, the field of view changes, and very importantly, the weight changes. That's one of the reasons why I said go for a Galilean if you're a beginner and if you're only below 3.5x, because the weight is going to be less, it's much easier to accommodate to. I would never recommend anyone to buy like a high 4.5, 5.5x prismatic as their first time loops. Do not make this mistake. You will regret it in most cases, and you'll be very disappointed with your purchase, which is not a good thing. You can see the, how the, the depth also changes. As you increase the magnification, the amount of depth you have also changes with more magnification. So you're getting more magnified, more clear for what you want to see, but not much else around that. And what about the declination angle? So the declination angle over here is what this picture illustrates it well. But essentially, even with loops on, you still have to tilt your neck to a certain amount, except in this last pair where there's even Admetech has something similar where you could basically keep your head straight because the loops actually direct downward. They use mirrors and they direct downward. So it may look like you're looking at the door of your operatory because you're going to be looking straight ahead, but actually you're looking inside the patient's mouth, very similar to a microscope. So that's these, these are called like ergonomic loops. They have different names. Uh, Surgital calls it their FLM loop. But really these are recommended for people with neck aches or a stiff neck, you know, generally neck cervical issues. This is something I've tried these loops. I found them difficult to get used to. I tried a demo pair. But these loops are even more specific in terms of they need to be really perfect for you to get used to them. And if you're getting a demo pair from a company, more often than not, they are not going to be the exact interpupillary distance you need and not the same working distance which you're used to. So you may struggle with the demo pair. So then buying these ergonomic loops is kind of a, a leap of faith that it's going to work for you. But if you're having neck issues, I would say you have to give these a try because this is something which could potentially be a game changer for you. So let's talk about what do um, what do the companies measure? Okay, so because these are custom-made loops, we are not talking about these kinds of magnifications. We are talking about custom-made loops, either TTL or flip-up or whatever. What do they what do they measure? They measure the interpupillary distance, okay? This is very important because they need to know exactly where to put the, the optics. And they also will, why, why is this important? If they get the IPD wrong in your loops, you're gonna start seeing double. You'll see two circles instead of converging correctly in the middle because both your eyes. When you close one eye, you'll be able to see fine, but when you open both eyes, you're gonna see two circles. That's when we know that the IPD is wrong. And the working distance measurement happens like this. You need to be in your typical working posture with the patient. You please get a demo patient to sit there and measure it accurately, as accurately as possible, and take a couple of measurements. I prefer, if you're spending money on loops, and especially if you're spending good money for those more expensive pairs, I suggest a couple of things. Insist on your uh, representative coming and taking those measurements for you, or you can also, um, they sometimes have these frames. You can do the IPD measurement with the frames which you wear and it has a little dot and they ask you to click a selfie. Uh, those are some things which they do to get the IPD right. But the working distance is a little more challenging. You need to really have it measured by someone while you're working to understand what your working distance is. And you need to be in a way, you should not say my working distance is this hunched over position. You should be straight and comfortable because that's the working distance we want to measure. So you can get loops which gives you everything in focus 
at that comfortable position where you're straight, okay? And remember, if you have a lesser magnification, you have more play in this working distance because your depth of field is more. You can see more back and forth, right? So what are the other things they measure? They measure the temple length, the nose bridge, the declination angle, like I told you about the ergonomic loops. They measure that as well. They will also ask you to get a prescription. So you need to go to the optometrist and get a prescription if you have any kind of uh, power in your eyes. So you need to get that checked. And it's always a good idea, even if you've been wearing the same pair of glasses for the past 10 years. It's a very good idea to get this checked because changing these things is very difficult. It's frequently expensive. And that's something which you, you need to consider. So there's so much for the loops, right? Now, a couple of sort of pointers on loops. First, make sure that the company you're buying for is willing to send you a demo unit. The demo unit should be close to your IPD. It shouldn't be too far off, okay? And you should be able to measure your IPD quite easily just with a ruler. So you should measure at least the IPD and figure out and get the demo pair. You need to have a demo pair. Do not buy any pair of loops without a demo pair because there's just a lot of... Um, there's a lot of little, little nuances which are there when it comes to uh, purchasing the right pair. Now, remember that demo pair is not going to be 100% for you because it's not made for you. It's going to give you an idea of what it feels like. It may even give you a headache because it's not exactly made for you. So don't be surprised by that, but it's just for you to get used to the concept of loops. What does the feel like? You know, some people, they try on the demo pair and they say, oh, I don't want this pressure on my nose. I'm going to get a headband style loops instead they may say that and and that's fair you know that's okay so these are the things which you need to talk to the company beforehand also ask them i remember this now someone about a year ago on instagram sent me a message saying oh you know i purchased this pair of loops from this brand and i'm seeing double and the and the company rep is saying that uh it's going to accommodate on its own it will not you cannot so i i essentially told that person they need to take it up with the company very forcefully and threaten to expose them on social media. And then the company did the right thing and actually replaced and she got she got the perfect fitting pair for her. And she was happy after that. So remember that these are expensive items. And if the company has got a measurement wrong or, you know, they're just the loops were not made correctly, they need to have the responsibility to fix that for you. It's not a sell once and forget it, which is why in this particular business, the customer service aspect of it is extremely important it has to be uh very very uh you need to have a good relationship and they need to be easily available for you in case changes need to be made where you need to pay after you purchase the loops is if your prescription changes that's not the company's fault you know that happened to your eyes your prescription changed maybe you have now plus power you need reading glasses etc for those reasons, they will have to charge you because they're going to change a lot of a lot of those loops to get them right for you again. So you will have to pay for that. And of course, you have to pay for any breakage or damage. So be careful. OK, so much for loops. Very, very short discussion about lights. You have to get lights. I made the mistake of my first pair getting uh, just a pair of loops without a light. And I, like I said, it improved my work about 30 percent. But once I get got the light, that was the absolute game changer for me. So the light makes a huge difference. And you can choose between the wireless or the wired. So this is Admitech, the one on the left. There's a lot of um, companies which have this design. But you see the thing that says butterfly on top? That's the battery pack. So you have the light mounted on the, on the head of the loops. And you have this battery pack, which is magnetic, and it clicks on and the light turns magically on. Now, the thing I don't like about wireless is the battery life is short. My procedures, what, what I do, I'm a process honest, so sometimes my procedures are two, three hours. This battery life is somewhere around two hours, and then I would need my assistant to take out this one and place the other one and put this one on charge. I find these things very frustrating to do. So, and also I'm always worried about contamination and too much of like touching during the procedure not so happy about that so i didn't go in for a wireless system but i preferred a, a wired system which is what you see over here however the wire can be cumbersome i've heard a dentist telling me oh you know the wire is annoying it gets caught in the hair but once you kind of figure it out after a week or so the wire for me at least is is just normal it's just part of my everyday dentistry 
The advantage is the battery life is much, much, much longer with the wire because you have an actual battery pack attached to it. The other question which will come up when you uh, buy loops is whether you need cordless or cord, whether wired or wireless. Besides that, we have the brightness. Companies are going to tell you there's 35,000, there's 80,000, there's 220,000. They'll tell you that this may be too bright for you or that may be too dark for you or because this high magnification, you need more light. They're going to tell you a lot of things. But I would say even the LED lights, don't buy them without trying them. You need to get that demo. You say, I want my loops and my light for the demo. And only then once I try them, I'm going to purchase. And you set your foot down with that statement. Do not buy these things without trying them. Because the other thing I notice is there's a difference in light quality. Sometimes some lights are more yellow, some lights are more white. Uh, these things can become confusing. Um, and it really comes down to personal preference. And then also with this brightness stuff, some companies rate their brightness at a certain amount and then you compare it to the competitor's company and whose brightness is rated lower. But when you look through it, the lower brightness seems brighter. I can't explain it. I don't know why it happens. It's just different ways of companies sort of um, placing their product, so to speak. And then there's also a variation in the magnification. With the magnification itself, they may tell you it's seven and a half X in company A. But then you compare that with company B, it's really more like a four and a half X. So even that X factor, the magnification factor, which they list, there's a lot of marketing behind it. So again, when you try it on is when you really know. So that is something which you have to keep in mind. So with that uh, being said, I'd like to thank you. That concludes the presentation, but I'm gonna show you a few loops and uh, let me see here. What else do we have? You already saw, you know, the ones which I don't want you to buy. Is it clear? You're able to see it, right? I think let me remove this virtual background uh, and I think you'll be able to see this better. There we go. Okay, so those are the ones you really shouldn't buy. They're about two, three thousand bucks on Amazon. Uh, please don't buy them. Then moving up we have something a little better, which you also saw these. So this doesn't put any weight on the bridge of the nose and it, it rests on the head. But some people don't like that. They, they, you know, they feel that that pressure is worse than this pressure. So you kind of have to decide for yourself. And then these have the adjustments as well. These are a little bit fancier than that. But again, I would, I would not recommend this because these are, again, not custom made. These tend to move. These screws uh, don't really hold well, I wouldn't recommend this style of loops either. There is, however, a Korean company, Dr. Kim's, which makes something like this, uh, which is pretty high quality. This was my first pair of real loops. These are oroscoptics. This was a two and a half X. You can see the magnification. This is Galilean. This is not prismatic because it's two and a half X. They have these little side shields over here. I don't think oroscoptic has the presence in India. But uh, this is essentially uh, what it is. These are oroscopic. These were comfortable. My, the mistake I made with these is they do not have the LED light. I didn't buy the LED light component. Then we move on to my next pair. This is a design supervision. This, oh yeah, I didn't talk about the frame. So you can have something more metallic and formal looking like these types of frames. Or you can have something which is more sporty like this. But these sporty ones have a limitation. Usually you can go up to about three and a half X with these. And then you need to go to uh, more metallic, heavier frames when you're stepping up the magnification. So these are three and a half X. These are also Galilean. This is, this is really a favorite pair of mine. I've had these now for 10 years. And uh, I'm really quite happy with them, although they are falling apart. Like the nose pads are falling apart. It really needs to go in for service. It's cracked in a couple of places. This thing has seen some tough times, okay? And then finally, uh, my current pair, which I use, this is a four and a half X magnification. So this is also design supervision. The, you can see the light, which I'm using over here. Now the, the advantage of this one, these are called panoramic design supervision. They are, they are pretty expensive. But the reason they are expensive is even though they are a four and a half X, they have great field of view and they have great depth of field because typically with the four and a half, you would expect that you're only seeing this little tiny area, but actually seeing quite wide and quite deep. So I, I have started using them for surgery as well. 
one of the things is, you know, as you get more and more into magnification, uh, be prepared to be uh, frustrated by your own work because you're going to be looking at your own work and you're going to be like, hey, this can be so much better. So you may take a little bit more time initially, but then you'll develop skills because you're able to see what you do. I think most bad dentistry is because of lack of access or lack of being able to visualize what we're doing and not so much skill. So I think I think skill can be taught largely. So I think that's something which you guys need to consider. And then the LED light is over here. So this has a little battery pack. Uh, these go in and plug in over here. How does that work? Yeah. So these plug in over here. The other end of this plugs in to the head unit. And there we go. The light's on. So the nice thing about these, and they don't make this model anymore, but this has this rather large button. So this button is under my scrubs. It's on my on my on my waist. And I would just use my arm to kind of turn it on and off. I don't need to use my gloved finger to touch that button. So that's convenient over here. So I like this old design. They don't make it anymore, unfortunately. They change the design up. But those are the pairs of loops that I own. Um, I hope I've confused you enough. I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you so much, sir. It was very interesting to hear from you. You have made a colloidal mix, which was earlier a colloidal mix, now a crystalline clear water. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have so many questions waiting for you, sir. I'll just address them. The first one is that how much magnification do you suggest for a first time loop user? I would say two and a half to three, um, not more than that. Two and a half to three should be okay. okay a little bit more than that will be difficult to accommodate to. Right. And so how do we decide the depth of view? What That's of not view? for you to decide. The depth of field is dictated by your your magnification so the lesser magnification you have the more depth of field you have Understood. but it's not your decision you're not going to be able to tell the company hey i want i want 10 centimeters depth of field they're going to say what magnification do you want that's going to be the question okay so understood uh, and there is another question that for endo work which loops are the best yeah so there's no best in this i can tell you a couple of things right i can say in India, Design So Vision probably is like the premium product. Uh, they are the more expensive ones, but you, you get what you pay for. Uh, the other brands available, which are also very good. I have personal experience with Admitech. They are very good. I think I've, I've invited both uh, Mr. Jigish and Mr. Paresh to attend this webinar. I hope they are here somewhere. Uh, but they are, uh, they are good. Admitech Design So Vision is good. I've heard very good things about Univet. I have no personal experience with this brand. Uh, their Carl Zeiss is a name that keeps coming up. Carl Zeiss is expensive. I don't like Carl Zeiss because I find them quite heavy. Uh, the lights especially are very heavy. And I think they're not compatible with other lights. And that's a problem. Like I would like to buy a Surgitel loop and I would like to put a Design So Vision light. I want to mix and match. But I think Carl Zeiss, you're kind of limited to only Carl Zeiss. That information may be outdated. It may be wrong, but... That's what I've been told. But the main issue for me with Carl Zeiss is the weight. So when you ask me for endo, which loops work the best, I don't know because you have to try. Uh, but again, if you're a first time loop user and you're only doing endo, I would not go more than 3x. Maybe 10 years after that, go into, go into 4x or 5x or just go straight to a microscope because it's endodontics. Okay. okay. And uh, I think I've answered the other two questions from Dr. Rekha. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, there is another question that for the flip-up loops, is it necessary to get, get the interpupillary distance measured? So if it's the flip-up loops, which is uh, which you can move around, meaning if it's these types of loops, which you have an adjustment over here, you don't need to uh, obviously uh, get your IPD measured because you can move this back and forth. And even this, you can see this mechanism is so janky. It's not really great. Um, but yeah, it is. Are you able to see the video? Because I can't. Yes, sir. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Yeah. So one second. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So if you're able to make these adjustments in the flip up loops, you can get flip up loops, which are also customized. Like I said, the Dr. Kim's one, 
I believe is a fixed. You can't really move it around, but it is flip up. So if you can manually move the IPD, you don't need to measure it, obviously, because you will change it uh, according to your convenience. Thank you, sir. We have a very interesting question coming up. That is loop dependency a thing? And if so, how to go around it? I'm definitely dependent on my loops. It is a thing. Uh, I don't like doing dentistry without loops and my light because I just see so much better. Um, the other funny thing that happens is if you're now I'm used to my four and a half X. If I wear my two and a half X, actually, things look even smaller than without loops which is i cannot explain it i don't know why like if i look at my finger now with just my eyes and no loops and if i put my two and a half x on things looking smaller in the two and a half it's almost like I, it's it's something to do with the brain the brain gets used to that big magnification and it kind of craves it loop depend dependency is a thing but also doing good dentistry for the rest of your life is also a thing so I think there is there is that trade off. For for me, I find it difficult to work with our loops. I find it frustrating actually. If my loops, let's say, broke today and I dropped it, I would take the day off tomorrow because I would not be happy working. Right. So also, uh, okay, there is another question before I take that one. That if someone is myopic, uh, so do they need to send their prescription? Yeah. And they say that the loops are being provided by their college. So how do they go ahead? If the, if the loop, see, it depends on what type of loops are being provided by the college, right? If they are these types where you can adjust everything, then they are going to be those cheaper pair. And that's what I expect that they are. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know how those, uh, what to say, off the shelf loops would, would uh, control for myopia. You would have to wear glasses and then you would have to wear a headband style loops which comes over the glasses that's the only way but in the ttl style you would have uh no problem because the plano the glass would be accommodating for the myopia okay right understood sir thank you so also do uh, does the long-term continuous use of loops affect eyes in some way i'm sorry the, does, does it affect the eyes yeah, does it affect the eyes in some way? A long-term continuous use of loops? Not, not that I know of. Okay. So it's just the brain that messes up, as you said, that 2x is even smaller than the normal vision. You, you get used to it. You get kind of spoiled by the big magnifications. So then going back to a lesser magnification is, is not so fun. Like I'm able to go back to my 3.5x, but I'm not able to go back to my 2x. Just... It's like impossible for me. I would rather than work without anything. Okay, sir. Understood. Uh, our participants are asking for some budget-friendly brands for dental yeah. for freshers. So again, Admitech and Univet are reasonably budget-friendly and maintain the quality. Uh, there is another brand called Ergoptics. I believe it's an Indian brand, uh, but I think they are not the custom style of loops. You'd have to go to their website and check. I think it's the type you can, you can adjust and stuff like that. But those typically come out much cheaper. Um, and let's say you're not going to buy loops for whatever reason, then at least get a light. The light itself is a fantastic uh, addition because you'll be able to see things so much better. The, the, the operatory headlight, whether it's an LED or a halogen, the chair light is is practically useless. That light is for your assistance. You need something better. Right, right, sir. So also there is then another question that, as you mentioned, that the demo loops that the company provides, uh, they we can't really tell, you know, from the demo loops that if they are working for us or not. So yeah. Can you uh, recommend some companies who customize the demo loops for us to, you know, try on? They won't really do that then how because do you getting a pair of loops is an expensive thing even for those companies which are operating in India because they have to import those loops. The best bet is they would have maybe five demo loops with different IPDs and your IPD matches close to that one. You know, But like I said, with the demo loops, you may even get headaches. It's just for you to get used to the concept of loops and see where you are with it and then decide if you can go ahead. For example, I tried the ergonomic loops, the ones which you look straight, but it's actually looking down like a microscope. And I immediately knew that this thing is not going to work for me. Like I like absolutely dead sure. 
But then the company contacted me and they are now trying to figure out if they can get a pair which is close to my IPD for me to try again. Um, so companies may be able to do that for you. But uh, unfortunately, this is a reality with demo loops. It's everyone is unique in terms of their IPD and their working distance. And you can't expect the company to have a whole slew of options just for you. As you said, it would take a leap of uh, faith to mm -hmm. start with them. Yeah. Right. We have Dr. Chinmaya with us. And the question is that, can you please explain a bit more on finding the focal spot since you mentioned not to identify using your thumbs? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi, Chinmaya. Uh, the way to do this is get your patient into their reclined position where you would typically work. Adjust the headdress. Make sure it's correct for the patient supporting the occipital region. And then you would sit straight up and you would have someone with a, with a ruler measure the distance from your eyes to let's say four, five, okay? So that'll be one measurement. Then you measure the distance from your eyes to let's say one, five, something like that to get an idea of what that working distance is. That's how you would do it. That's a real life example. Uh, preclinical, it's a little bit difficult. Your question says preclinical, uh, challenging. I would, I would want an actual patient there because that is going to be more real life. I'm sure you could do it preclinical, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. And so sh should separate loops be used for preclinical -clin work and the clinical work? No, why? Why would you do that? Because of the distance? No, you have to maintain good posture and the same distance for both preclinical and clinical work. So this, no, okay. no way. Understood. Okay. Let me just rush through the questions. The magnification for prosthodontic work, sir. For endo, you mentioned that 3.5 and maybe after 10 years, we can go to 4.5 or 5.5. What right. about prosto? So I started with two and a half. It was okay, but I didn't have the light. Then I went on to three and a half, which was fantastic. It was my workhorse for 10 years. I think most prosthodontists would be comfortable with, with uh, three and a half. There was something newer, potentially better, and that's why I went for four and a half. Uh, but I don't think any prosthodontist should start with four and a half. It's a little too aggressive. But remember, like some companies, they may say it's four and a half, but it's really more like a three and a half. It's kind of hard. So when I'm saying three and a half, four and a half, I'm I'm referencing uh, either oroscopic or design supervision type of standards. So that is something to keep in mind. Okay, so thank you. And if someone is willing to, is wishing to use pr uh, prismatic loops for the first time, like as a first time user, what are the cautions that they should be careful about? Uh, you have to be cautious that you may not like it because it's going to be heavy. It's going to be heavier than a Galilean. And I wouldn't know why you would make that decision for prismatic as the first time. Generally, it's the company guys would push you to do this because prismatic is typically more expensive. Uh, if you're within three and a half, please just buy a galley and make your life simple. It's cheaper, it's lighter, it's your first time. So I would say go with something easier. Don't go, don't go too aggressive. Thank you, sir. Okay. And so can you comment something about the Endo King loops available for the beginners? Endo King? Yes. I need to look this up because I have no idea what this is. Hold on, let me Google. Endo King. Endo King loops. Okay, these guys make other stuff. Oh, this is on. Okay, this is very similar to what I showed. That's basically this type. Uh, yeah, these are they. You can do your IPD. These are not going to be great. They're going to be heavy. Um, they're not going to be super clear. They are. They cost three thousand five hundred rupees. You're going to get what you pay for. Uh, these don't look very nice. Can't recommend them. Sorry. We'll take your word for that, sir. Sir, Dr. B.K. Arora asked that whenever he uses loops, it causes pain in the neck and he feels uncomfortable. So should he stop using them? Yeah, because if these are loops which are customized for you and that's happening, you need to take it up with the company. If they're just something like this Endo King or whatever it is, then in that case, uh, I'm not surprised you're having those problems. Okay, okay, sir. We have so many questions, sir. Our students, our attendees are making the well, well use of your presence here. Yeah. 
I think we are done. You have answered most of the questions already. Yeah, they seem to be a little repetitious. So when they see the recording, I guess they'll be able to have those questions answered. So. Uh, sir, uh, a unique question comes up that for a consulting visiting dentist, uh, you know, someone who's visiting multiple clinics and how do they adjust their life around loops? Do not have an ideal and properly adjusting chair setup. Okay, this question is a little odd. Because if you're going to like various clinics, regardless of the dental chair which they have, you're still going to put the position in, put the patient in a position which is comfortable for you to work in, which is going to be probably even less than 45 degrees, somewhere around 60 degrees or more. And then you measure it. It doesn't matter in which clinic you measure, but the patient and you are going to be in the same setup. I don't understand how a clinic would not have a properly adjusting chair set up because every dental chair I know of has recline. You can recline in all of them. So I'm not sure where this question is coming from because this is not something I can imagine would be a problem. Like, can we finally adjust the distance very accurately as to what is you know customized with our loops? No, so again, if you're a beginner, you're going to get a two and a half X. And let's say you measured your working distance as X. Because it's two and a half X, you're going to have a lot of depth of field. So that means even if your head was a little bit back or a little bit forward, things are still going to be in focus because it's two and a half X. But if it's four and a half X, that depth of field, that play becomes much less. So one, one thing is like, let's say one great advantage of having lesser magnification when you start out you have this good range, the weight is less, and you can measure your, your, your loop. A company will tell you that, you know, these loops we have given you at whatever, 16 or 20 or whatever working distance. And now you have that value already set for you. So when you're going for the four and a half X or whatever else, higher magnification, you can just tell them, I know my working distance, it's 20 because it's worked for me in my older pair. So this is something which you can translate. Understood. And if someone can afford a dental operating microscope, should they still be going for loops or should they have an extra pair of loops? I would say you need both uh, because if you're doing microscope, you're not going to be able to do checkups with your microscope. It's too cumbersome. You need to move things around a lot. You can't do a general OPD style consultation with your microscope. All that is for procedures. So what happens when you're not using the microscope? You need to still see and that's where I still use my loops, even for consultations. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you so much. One last uh, question, sir, that uh, is there something like pediatric exclusive loops? Pediatric exclusive loops, not that I know of. For pediatric, I would, I would do a couple of things differently for pediatric. Because pediatric is usually shorter procedures, I might consider wireless, the battery. Um, and I would probably stop at about 2.5x because the more contraptions on the face, the more terrifying the dentist looks. So I would think the kids would get scared. So I would probably stop with 2.5x. But this is uh, not a good question for me because I'm far, far from being a pediatric dentist. Also, I think, sir, it's very difficult to maintain a constant distance uh, for pediatric patients. Yeah, that's also so. That, again, that's where the um, that's where the uh, benefit of the two and a half x and the and the lot of depth of field uh, comes into play. Right. Okay, sir, that marks the end of a very interesting question and answer session. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your invaluable time to be with us today. And you're truly a sun in, it, in its full glory and you light up every person in the room. Thank you so Thank you. much for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to tell the audience, um, I hope you guys, I hope to see you in Kochi. Uh, this wonderful channel has made this webinar happen. But we're going to have uh, a lot of great names in our field in Kochi. We're going to have Dr. Ali Tunkiwala, Dr. Kachwala, Dr. Jacob, uh, Dr. Udatke, Dr. Shankar Rayer, of course. Dr. Akshay Kumar Swami, Dr. Ashwini Pade, there are so many names, Dr. Neil Batwadekar, Prithvi Balipur, I mean, I, I, Dr. Yazad Gandhi, who I just saw today in Chennai, there are so many names. Uh, this is going to be uh, an absolutely fantastic educational experience for you. So I do hope to see you guys in Kochi, November, what is it, 26 to 28? Yes, sir. Yeah, perfect.
your word will be taken care of very sincerely, sir. And before we end, I would like to share the brochure with our audience, if you may allow, sir. Sure, absolutely. So this is Dentist Channel Online, and I feel very excited that we are organizing the World Implant Expo 2023 in Pochi from November 26 to 28th, and we have a galaxy of luminaries joining us from all across the globe. We still have four days left for our early bird offer, so you may go and avail it to the best of our abilities. We have our upcoming webinar with Dr. Aman Huller. So make sure you join with us and make the best use of it. Thank you so much for your patient listening and thank you once again, Dr. Varun, for your invaluable time and the words of wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Aditi. And all of you have a nice Sunday. Uh, go spend some time with your family. Stop, stop studying. Stop doing dentistry. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Have a good day. See you.